Hi everyone, Krista Cowan here with another episode of The Barefoot Genealogist. Today we are talking about researching in state archives. Now, whether you are new to family history or you've been doing family history for a while, I think you're going to find some useful content with us today. If you live in the United States or are doing research in the United States, this is going to be super pertinent. But if you don't, I think you'll still find some genealogical principles here that will be really useful to you, whether you're researching because you live in another country or whether you are researching ancestors who lived in another country. So let's go ahead and dive in. Um, I just want to start with this great graphic. This was created by the California Genealogical Society years ago. It's been circulating around the internet for a while, but it illustrates a principle that I just want to talk about briefly. What you're going to see there is that you've got this water line and the iceberg, what's above it is what's available on the internet. Now Ancestry has billions of historical records available online. We add one to two million new records online every single day. And so in a world where people who have been doing family history for a long time remember scrolling through microfilm or having to you know, take vacation time to come to Salt Lake City and go to the family history library, the availability of records is sometimes mind-boggling and it feels like everything is just available at our fingertips and in many ways that's true. Ancestry has done a wonderful job making records accessible and available, searchable, hintable and that really has um, sped up the process of discovering more about our family history. However, there are still billions of historical records around the world that have not yet been digitized and put online or that are being digitized by local organizations, libraries, archives, genealogical societies. Um, and so you have to know where to find them. Now, one of the things that new people often ask me is, well, I found my grandpa in, a census, you know, in the 1920 census. Why do I need to go look for more information about him? It tells me how old he was and where he was born and who his parents were. And that's great. That is useful and vital information to building your family tree. But one of the things that we often discover in archives and libraries and courthouses are additional records that do a few things. Sometimes they give us a broader picture or more information to understand who our ancestors were. So if all you're looking to do is just fill out a name on a chart, that's great. You can do a lot of that, most of that in many cases online. But if you're looking to really know your ancestors or come to understand them better, the more records you have about them, the better. The other benefit, and people who've been doing family history for a really long time understand this, is that the further back in time that you go, um, the less record availability there is online. So a lot of the modern records, 1940 census, 1930 census, um, birth, marriage, and death records from the 1900s, um, those have been digitized and made available online. And some of the more obscure, smaller um, collections back in the 1800s, 1700s, 1600s, only some of those have been digitized. And that's most often because they're going to be in all of these little state archives and libraries around the country or in archives that are around the world. So hopefully that introduction helps you understand a little bit about why knowing about archives is important. Um, one of the things that I would encourage you to do is to take the information that I'm going to share here in the rest of this video and just go explore a state or a country that you're interested in researching and just see what's available because that becomes a really mind-opening experience when you start looking into what the archive has. The possibilities get really exciting. It's kind of a shiny penny for me. Um, it was really hard preparing this presentation not to start diving into some of those things a little bit more deeply um, because there's always more things to learn and more things to discover. So I'm just going to walk you really briefly through kind of a process that I use when I'm starting to do research in a new state so that I can understand what records are available online, what records are available but online with the archive, what records are available offline in the archive itself. I'm going to talk about state archives and I'll use that word, but really it can apply to state libraries, local libraries, genealogical societies. I think the same principles apply whether you're researching in a U.S. state archive or whether you're researching anywhere in the world um, or at any jurisdictional level um, of other kinds of archives and repositories. So the first thing that I would strongly encourage you to do is to become very familiar with the Ancestry card catalog. 
If you are brand new to Ancestry or brand new to this video series, then you may not have heard about the card catalog. You may not be familiar with it. I've done an entire video on the card catalog, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time today on it, but I will just give you a brief um, little introduction here so that you understand kind of the basics. The card catalog is found under the search button. The difference is you're not searching for people in the card catalog. You're looking to see what records are available. You're going to come down here to card catalog. It's going to show you that as of today, Ancestry has 32,824 databases on our website. And just the simplest, easiest way to search this is by country or by state. So I can put in, for example, Tennessee and make sure I spell it correctly <laughs> um, and click search. And it will show me that Ancestry has 127 databases full of records for the state of Tennessee. I can then narrow that down by record type or by time period if I'm looking for something specific. But if I'm just getting into research in a new location, like I said, my process is that I just start kind of exploring to see what's available. One of the things I want to understand is privacy and access. So here in the United States, every state sets their own laws that govern the privacy of their records, birth, marriage, and death records uh, in particular, but also other types of records. Some states, like here in Utah, have a 100-year privacy on birth records, for example. So if I wanted to get access to um, a birth record for somebody, it's likely not going to be online if they were, it's actually not going to be online if they were born within the last 100 years. Um, my own birth, I happen to have been born here, my own birth certificate, if I want access to it, I have to go down to the county health department um, in the county where I was born in order to gain access to that particular record. Now, if I wanted access to a record of a, an uncle who was born here, I couldn't get access to that. Uh, so it's not going to be online, and I'm not going to be able to get access to it um, because of the privacy laws that govern that. So important to understand that, that not every state is like that. North Carolina, Texas, Ar um, California, those are just the ones I can think of off the top of my head. They, their privacy laws all state that birth, marriage, and death records are considered public record. And so you can access those records, and a lot of them are available online. Now, access, so privacy is one thing, access is another. So access is also determined by each organization that holds the records. Um, so privacy is usually governed by state law. Access is governed by the particular organization that holds the records. And they determine in negotiation with Ancestry how much access they'll give us to the records that are publicly available. And in some cases, that means they just let us come in and digitize the records and index them and put them online. Oftentimes we'll share copies of those records, digi those digital records back with the archive. Um, it's a really great relationship. Um, sometimes they'll actually allow us copies of like the birth certificate, for example, or the death certificate, and you'll see images in those cases online. But sometimes the archive or organization, um, their access rules only allow Ancestry to have a copy of an index. And so all we'll have available is an index to that record with a source citation that tells you who holds that original record. And in some cases, that's going to be the state archive or the state library or some other um, repository within that particular jurisdiction. So it's really important to understand that when there's only an index available online, and usually we try to list that as the, in the title of the database, you know, records versus indexes, um, sometimes there's both in a single database, and so there's a little bit of ambiguity until you actually look at the record that you're interested in. But if all you see is an index, if there's no image attached, very often you can then contact the state archive or repository that holds the original record and get a copy of the record. Because it's not about privacy, it's just about access. Hopefully that makes sense and helps you start to wrap your head around the idea of some of the records that are available, but that card catalog in my research process is always my, my first stop so that I can see what is and is not available online, um, and then I go from there. Now, to see what is and is not available at all, <laughs> um, online in Ancestry, online at the Archives website, or offline in the Archive itself, Ancestry has created a series of free state research guides. So we've created one for every state, Washington, D.C., Puerto Rico. We've started creating some for other countries. We have research guides for different um, 
ethnicities for doing research in like African American records or Jewish records. Um, so these state research guides are a really great resource. You're going to find them in the support center. So you just click on help and you go to the support center. And in the Ancestry Support Center, you're just going to, in the search box there, type in state research guides or research guides if you're looking for um, one of the others. But state research guides, and the very first link that will come up is for U.S. state research guides. That will show you a list of all of the um, research guides that are available. Now, these particular research guides uh, are PDF files. There are a few pages long, each one of them, but um, they are PDF files, so you can download them. Most web browsers have some kind of a download function, so you can download them to your computer. You can print them off if you want. I know several of you like to have tangible things in hand to work with as you're doing your family history research. I would encourage you, if you want to print them off, go ahead and print them off, but at least download a copy or bookmark where you can find this online at Ancestry because... Um, I'll, I'll show you here in a minute, there are actually clickable links within this document that's going to allow you to get um, to some of the resources available a little bit more quickly. Now, let me explain briefly how these research guides are laid out. At the beginning, we're going to have some history, some just history of the location, um, and that's really important as genealogists to at least have a basic understanding of when people started settling this area, what, what caused people to migrate in and out of this area, that's going to help you uh, in your research. Then we're going to have some basic information about some record types that were kept by the state, some that are available on Ancestry. Oftentimes we'll have a little bit of a timeline that gives you um, some details. And then as you get down here, um, lots of lots of links okay then as you get down here you're going to see a section entitled other state resources now let me make that just a little bit bigger on the screen there so other state resources we are going to serve up a list of links of repositories again state archives libraries genealogical societies historical societies that have records either online just on their own website or mostly offline in their repository so that you know what is available. So for example, here we have the Illinois State Archives. I can click that, it will take me to their website. Uh, you'll see here, um, they have digitized some stuff. Most of this stuff is gonna be available offline. They also have a link on their website for genealogical research. And so you can click that and understand exactly what records they have said these are available for genealogy or these are, are useful for genealogy. See, here's the thing about genealogical records and state archives. State archives are responsible for government records created within that state, and then typically um, they'll often have acquisition of records from some other sources. And so not all the records in a state archive are useful for genealogists. You know, sometimes there's things um, about legislation or about particular government leaders, and maybe that's not useful for research. Most archives, however, have a set of records that they know genealogists access or use on a regular basis. And so a lot of times they'll have them tagged or somehow marked that these are useful. The thing is, none of those records were created for genealogical purposes. That's one of the things we sometimes tend to forget when we work with census records and birth, marriage, and death records. None of those records were created for the purpose of building a family tree. They're all created for other purposes. And so a lot of archives have somehow grouped or categorized this set of records as genealogical records. Always start there, but know that they also have a lot of other records that maybe might be of interest to you. So look for some kind of catalog. Now, here's the challenge with researching in uh, state archives. First of all, you always want to go to their website, check it out, see what they've got available. And some state archives websites are fantastic. They're really well laid out. They make sense. Like Illinois here, they maybe have a section that takes you directly to a page about genealogical research and provides you with very specific information about how to interact with the archive remotely, like how they have a reference request form, like you can submit a genealogy research request to the state archive electronically and then, you know, have somebody do some of that research there for you. In this case, they also have links to specific, like I said, collections of records that they have identified that are important to genealogists that they hold um, in their archive. That's fantastic. 
but not every state website is laid out the same way and not every state website is laid out as easily. And so just spending some time with the website, clicking around, getting familiar with it. I always um, encourage people, look first for, like here on the Illinois site, some kind of a link that leads you to a genealogy landing page. It serves as a portal for the requests that the archive gets relating to genealogy. That will usually be the best place for you to spend your time. The next thing that you want to um, look for if they don't have that or if you've explored that is any kind of a digital portal or any kind of a digitization project. In this case here, there's a link um, on the Illinois site to databases. So they actually have collections of records that they have digitized themselves that they're making available. And then the third thing you want to look for, so genealogy, digital collections or databases, the third thing that you want to look for on the State Archive website is um, going to be any kind of a catalog. So like on Ancestry, we have that card catalog. All archives have some form of catalog, and most of them make some form of that catalog searchable and available online. Now, the difference between the card catalog on Ancestry and the card catalog on a State Archives website is typically that State Archives catalog is just going to show you what they hold in their possession. On Ancestry, you can see what we have, you can click on it, you can search it, you can find a record. In the State Archive catalog, you can search for a type of record, you can search for a specific location within the state, and see what kind of tax records they have, or land records, or maps, or um, marriage records, or whatever the case may be, but you're not going to be able to search for people within those records. That's just going to tell you that the records exist, and then you can figure out how to research. In the case of Illinois, for example, it's a matter of filling out a research request form. In some cases, if you've got a lot of research to do, you might be interested in planning a research trip to go spend a day or two at that particular archive doing your own research and lookups. But that's, um, that's kind of the basics, right? And again, that principle applies no matter where in the world you're researching. Um, see what's available. In this case, we've made, like I said, these research guides. So I could come here to Ohio, pull up the Ohio research guide, read all about the history and what records were created, look at the timeline, and then under um, uh, these links here toward the end of the document, under other state resources, I'm going to see links to the archives, I'm going to see links to the State Genealogical Society. Now, uh, one other nuance I just want to point out, in most states in the United States, they have a state archive and a state library. In some cases, those two entities have merged and they're one entity. Um, but there are some states that have like a state historical society and the archive falls under that. So the structure in every state, again, is going to be slightly different. In other countries, it's also going to be a little bit different. So for example, here in the United States at a country level, we have the National Archives and then we have the Library of Congress. And both of those entities have um, records available. Most genealogical records are held uh, by the National Archives, but I have used the Library of Congress for quite a few things as well. In Canada, for example, they have the Library Archives Canada. Again, one entity um, that serves um, both of those purposes. So every state, um, if you're in England, sometimes the counties, other countries, uh, they're all going to manage that process a little bit different. So if you look through this list of links and you don't see Ohio State Archives, um, look a little bit closer because what you're going to see, for example, here is the Ohio Historical Society and they have an archive. And then you're going to see the Ohio Genealogical Society and they have information. You're going to see links to um, libraries or state libraries, the Western Reserve Historical Society. I've used that um, organization for a little access to a lot of information about my family that immigrated or migrated to and through the state of Ohio. So um, just pay attention to this other state resources section in the state research guide and that's going to give you kind of the structure of how the records are held at that particular state level and then just go explore their websites. Now, if you get a little overwhelmed um, or if you're not sure where to turn um, after you've explored that state site or if you have questions, a lot of times on the state site they will have links directly to 
contact a researcher or a, a resource or contact a librarian. And so you can email or send some kind of a request in for, for additional information. Sometimes on those websites, they will also have links to social media. So not every state or country archive has social media accounts, but many of them do. And so look on their website, see if they've got a link to a Facebook page or if they've got a Twitter account, um, you can communicate with them that way. Or you can just go directly to Facebook and do a search for the particular state archive or library to see what's available. In this case, the state of um, Florida, the state archives has a Facebook page. Sometimes it will be a page, sometimes it will be a group. And if you're familiar with Facebook, pages and groups function a little bit differently. Um, groups, you usually have to join or request to be admitted to the group, and then you can message people within the group. Pages, typically you're going to see a big blue send message over here. So you can send a message directly to the archive that way, or you can post publicly on their wall. Messages are going to be private on Facebook, so just between you and the archivist. Posts typically are going to be public. Anybody who can see the page and most of your friends on your Facebook wall are going to be able to see that post. So, you know, write your message accordingly. Uh, one of the things that I would encourage you to do when you are interacting with a state archive, don't tell them your entire family history to ask your question. You don't need to do that. Um, think really carefully about what it is that you're looking for. Um, don't say, you know, do you have any Smiths living in Tallahassee? Um, you know, I want all the records pertaining to that. You're not going to get a response to that kind of a request. Um, better might be to say, do you have tax records for Tallahassee between 1897 and 1906? Are those records available? I couldn't find that information on your website. That's going to be a much more specific question. Then they'll tell you, do the records exist or not exist? Then you can follow that up with a question about, do I need to come to research those in person or do you have research assistance um, available through the archive? Some archives uh, have the funding and the manpower to, to handle requests. And so you can send in research requests like um, the Illinois site we were just looking at. You can send in one request at a time, maybe two. Um, you can't send in more than that. They process them. Um, I've had some libraries and archives that get back to me within 48 hours. And I've had some where it takes 12 weeks. So every archive, based on their funding and their staffing, uh, have different response rates. And if you continue to bother them with your same problem or continue to flood them with problems, um, sometimes, sometimes it just slows things down a little bit. <laughs> That's the kind way to say that. Um, but uh, so I find usually that if I am messaging them on a Facebook page or through email directly through their website or on any kind of a form that they've provided, I send in my request and then I wait. And if it's been longer than a month, I might make a quick phone call or post a little public post on their Facebook page that just says, I sent in a request about four weeks ago. I'm just wondering what your, um, you know, what your time is right now. If it's 12 weeks, if it's six months, that's fine. I just need to know that um, so that I can plan my research accordingly. So just keep in mind, um, a lot of these people in these archives, they're government employees. A lot of times they're underfunded and understaffed and a little bit overwhelmed and um, they don't exist to serve genealogists. They exist to serve the people of their state and to preserve and protect and provide access to those records. And they're doing the best they can, most of them. And so um, I'm, I'm typically way more patient <laughs> uh, than maybe I should be. Sometimes maybe I should be a little bit more um, uh, aggressive, but I have chosen not to be and I find that I get a, usually get a really good response um, when I'm messaging people through Facebook pages or emails about what records they have in their possession. And sometimes, if you're really nice, um, even when they don't typically provide research services, if I say, oh, I just, I, you know, I live in Utah, I don't have access to records in, you know, Ohio right now, somebody will look something up for me or copy something for me and send it to me in an email. So lots of really great records, sometimes the best records that are available, um, to break through some of those brick walls back in the early 1800s, late 1700s, are gonna only be found in those particular archives. That one little piece of information you need to prove this woman's maiden name or to find the marriage between this couple or to prove that this guy is the son of this guy and not the other guy, like those are gonna be found in some of those state archives records. So 
Quick recap, start on Ancestry, see what we have available. One to two million new records every single day being placed online, lots of stuff for you to do online for sure. Um, but if you are interested in pursuing a particular brick wall on your family tree, or you've run out of online resources, we've got those state research guides in the Ancestry Support Center that are available for you with those clickable links that will take you to the state websites for various repositories. You can explore those state websites and then look for ways either on their website or on social media to communicate with the staff there at that archive about what kinds of records they have available for what time period and how best you can access those records. Sometimes that means taking a trip in person and you know what, what a great excuse for a little trip <laughs> um, that you have family history research to do and if you can you know, kind of collect enough research, it absolutely makes the trip worthwhile. Not just to spend time in the archive touching and smelling and interacting with those old records, but also because usually you're going to a place where your ancestors lived their lives. And I always love not just going to the archive, but also exploring the area where my ancestors lived, visiting the cemeteries, finding their, um, you know, their property, looking for whatever else um, may have been there. Sometimes it's just as simple as looking at a mountain that they stared at uh, every day for their whole life and feeling a little bit of that connection with them. Well, that's all I have prepared for you today. Hopefully that was useful information. If you have any questions about it, please feel free to leave it in the comments here on the YouTube channel. I do monitor those and respond as necessary. Also, if you have suggestions for topics for future episodes, feel free to email me there at askancestry.com with those video suggestions. And finally, I've got the entire March calendar for video topics uploaded to the Ancestry US Facebook page on our events tab. You can check that out, RSVP for those. Until next time, this is Krista Cowan. Have fun climbing your family tree.